Um, great. So first of all, I did uh, send you the emails concerning the homework. There are, like I said, like I wrote many times, probably many errors in there. Um, so please check if the amount of homework, uh, th please check if you got an email at first. And then if you have this, if you don't have an email, send me an email because then probably your GitHub account is not connected to your ad set login. And if you do have an email and the count, you think the count is wrong, then send me an email too and we will sort out this issue. Um, like I said, there are many unconnected accounts, so there would be many people that didn't get an email. Um, right, secondly, I have this vote here again on if you want to take the exam or not. I need to close this. Um, if you want to take the exam or not, I would like you to vote here. I also have the link in the homework sheet for more people to see that. Um, because it would be really nice to have an overview if there are even people who want to take the exam, and if there are none, we don't even have to make an exam. However, uh, vote uh, as you wish. Okay, um, I will not talk about the last homework today that was due right now, because I want to do that next week on Tuesday, because there won't be too much next week on Tuesday anyway. Um, for those of you who don't know, next week is not a full week anyway because Thursday is Christi uh, 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 I have no clue what that's in English. Um, but it's a, a holiday, so there won't be um, any class on Thursday, which is why we only have like half a session on Tuesday. I'll probably make a normal homework and a bonus anyway next week um, concerning pandas, but I'm not sure um, what else to do. I can finally show the debugger and stuff and a little more stuff. Okay, good. Let's continue where we left uh, on Tuesday. That was time series data. That was the last of the last Panda points. So like I said, Pandas was originally invented for time series data anyway. So Pandas is really great at working with this. The usual imports, you know these stuff. Okay, first of all, timestamps. Pandas is really nice at uh, converting strings into timestamps. You can simply make, um, you can simply call pandas .to date time with any string that corresponds to any date, and pandas can infer the timestamp from that. So, pandas timestamp is its only data. It's, it's um, a data type which, well, if you have the string representation, looks nice already, but internally it represents the time in nanoseconds. Um, and yeah, you can have any kind of string, and Pandas is able to convert most kinds of string into a timestamp, which is really, really nice. So you can have, uh, you can try it on different stuff. Um, but what we see here, if we have, uh, well, 04.06, Pandas will assume this is the American way of writing dates, the stupid way of writing dates, which is first month, then day, um, then year. Um, if you don't want that, you can have as argument day first equals two for the Europeans under us um, that think the day should come before the month and then converts correctly. You see that's a different date here. Okay, yeah, um, a date time can contain a time or not. And once I have this, I can, for example, also, I can then call date and this gives me only the date. Um, and I can call time, which gives me only the time. Um, yeah, if you don't specify a time, pandas will assume it's just uh, the start of the day. Uh, like I said, it has nanosecond accuracy. I, how many numbers should be nanoseconds? These are uh, nine numbers behind the comma, behind the dot, so that should be nanoseconds, I guess. And yeah, we have high accuracy here. But if you don't specify it, pandas will not show it because it doesn't assume you normally need, nan need nanoseconds. And from a timestamp, like I said, though, this is only the way Pandas prints the timestamp. From the timestamp, you can make simply all information available via its attributes. So you can get the year, the month, the day, second, microsecond, and the nanosecond. Okay, um, timestamps are nice because they can be compared. So if we simply had the date string, um, Pandas wouldn't know, uh, like Python wouldn't know what to do because it would compare the string, the signs of the string. And if we have a date, Pandas does it in the correct way. Um, because underlying the timestamp is its nanosecond representation anyway, so it can just compare the two nanoseconds and it's done. Okay, um, when pass a series, our two date time returns a series um, with something else than a series, 
which is still a list like it will convert into a daytime index to index other series. So this here is a series containing the dates and pandas will make, um, as we see, a series out of this and otherwise it will make a daytime index out of this. Um, we also see that if we have this none here, pandas will convert it to NAT, not a time, which, is, which corresponds to um, the not a number thingy for numbers, which is just the same thing for times. And PD dot is NA checks also for uh, not a time. Okay, good. These are timestamps. However, if we compare timestamps, we sometimes have a problem because, for example, if we get the timestamp from some database or something or from something online, it's probably going to be represented including the time zone or rather including the offset from the uni UTC, universal time. What is UTC? What does it even stand for? Never mind, from the UTC, um, and you cannot compare an offset naive and an offset aware daytime. And actually, if you try to do that anyway, uh, it will lead to something wrong because, well, the UTC is not our time right now, and if we try to compare those two times, um, it may be wrong. Actually, I made this mis that mistake when I made the, uh, correct the uh, correction script for the homework because the timestamps on GitHub are stored, of course, not offset naive, but offset aware. And then I was wrong by like two hours because uh, there was a different time zone where the, um, how it's stored and on my computer. And I didn't know that some, um, that you had, but some hands in were before the deadline. I assumed they were after the deadline, but they were not. That was an error by me because I didn't look at the time zones. So time zones are important. Um, yeah, you can get this. You can get the current time simply calling daytime.now. That's like nothing to do with pandas. That's just uh, the Python function on how to get the current time. But yeah, like I said, if you have the offset naive or time zone naive and time zone aware daytimes, you cannot compare them because well, it would be a stupid idea to do so, Chris. Okay, um, you can compare as we see here to offset naive daytimes. So this is just a daytime without any place of where it is. And if we call daytime.now, it will also create simply a normal offset naive daytime. And if we don't specify the offset or the, date, uh, the time zone here, the same would be here. So we can compare two offset naive daytimes. And how do we make an offset aware daytime? Well, we simply add this uh, plus and then the amount of uh, hours differencing from the universal time zone, UTC. And if we look at uh, what time zone, so the attribute for that is dot tz, this timestamp has, well, if we have an offset from, um, from zero hours from UTC, we obviously still in UTC. Um, can ask the same for our daytime.now object. This one doesn't have, so it's called time zone info here, and this here returns none, as we see, so there's no daytime in here, so uh, there's no time zone information here, so to check if a timestamp is, time is offset naive, does not contain a time zone, um, we, can, we have to ask for a normal timestamp if the time zone info and the time zone info offset from the universal time from the UTC is none. And that's the case for our daytime.now, so apparently we cannot compare them because the one as we see here knows its time zone is UTC and this one here doesn't, so we cannot compare them. We can, however, tell daytime.now that we want a certain time zone and that's why I imported this um, pi tz here, uh, Python time zone. And if we tell daytime.now as first argument that we want the time zone that corresponds to Europe Berlin, um, it will make a time zone aware timestamp. So if we add that, our time zone info knows now that we are in Europe Berlin, which is um, plus two hours because I think that depends on daylight savings time. That's what the DSD stands for. So, yeah, daylight saving time makes it even harder again. Probably we'll get rid of it. Hopefully we'll get rid of it in the future. But yeah, if we now compare um, date times with, which are both offset aware or time zone aware, we can do so. Okay, now I need to think 12.20 in UTC time and the time right now, is that correct? Time one should not be bigger than time two because we made a mistake, because 12.20, wait, is this correct? Yeah, 
So if we add the same thing without the time zone or the offset information here, each it will return false. And if we do so with the time zone information, it would return true. So apparently, we're doing something wrong here. Well, in time two, I say, well, give me the time right now in Berlin, so where we are. And here, this is the UTC time, which is not um, the same time in Berlin. So if we compare them, it says, yeah, well, 12 o'clock in, where's UTC even? Is it, is it Greenwich? Is UTC Greenwich? I'm not sure. Let's say Greenwich. So 12.20 in Greenwich is after 12.27 here in Berlin. So this is correct. It's just unintuitive if we're too stupid to think about time zones. Okay, however, there is a time zone convert and time zone localize. So first of all, let's try to convert our first time, which is UTC. Um, well, I just made a time zone um, naive timestamp. Let's make it a time zone aware timestamp again. So now I did it. And now if I convert my 12.20 UTC time to uh, the time in Europe Berlin, it knows that it's actually 2.20. So this 2.20 is definitely past uh, 12.27. So we were right on that. So be aware of your time, of your time zones. It always makes sense. OK, um, just as the same as adding this plus zero uh, hours, zero minutes, is simply saying, well, I want the UTC time. And we can simply convert this time zone then to Europe Berlin. And this then gives me the time here in um, Berlin where we are. Um, I cannot localize a time zone aware timestamp. Then this localize doesn't make sense. But localize is there for um, time zone naive timestamp. So to make a time zone naive timestamp to a time zone aware timestamp, I use time zone localize. So we see here, um, this used to be a time zone. So it's a time zone naive timestamp until here. And it's time zone aware right here. And it's 12.20 in Europe Berlin, which is what we want. So if we now compare this to um, daytime.now, which is by now 12.29, we see that uh, 12.29 right here is after 12.20 right here. So this is correct again. So if you're working with dates, be like know if you have time zone naive or time zone aware timestamps or all that stuff. So also at, at, uh, at work where I used to work at AIM, we had this problem once that, for example, there was like we had one, um, we had a time series, and then we collapsed that into one measure per date. But because um, of, like, of time zone changes, for one date, we had two, we had, um, we had two samples because it had the same sample again because we had to go to the new time. It didn't make much, like it did make sense problematically, but we took ages to figure that out. Let's look at your timestamps, like be always aware that you change, that if you change location, you also have to change the time zone eventually and all that stuff. It's gonna be a, a mess if you don't. Okay, as much for time zones. Um, good, what is this? Oh yeah, so I make a date range here, so, um, yeah, we can. So I simply created one date. This is a start date, TPD to data, and we know that already. And then we can make a date range, um, which which can uh, which then creates a date range. Wait, let me show you. So this here uh, creates a date time index. And if we simply say, well, I have a start date and I want um, a period of four, then we simply create this date and the next four days and makes a date time index out of this. And this index can then um, this index can then be made to uh, a series and used in a normal data frame. Okay, so I did that to show you again. So we can, for example, if we have this normal time in UTC, so this is like the time in UTC, which is 0. Point, uh, like it's, it's uh, the date at um, zero o'clock in the morning. We say zero o'clock in the morning, and if we localize that, we have first of like if we have this time zone naive timestamp, we first of all have to say, well, 
imagine this was UTC. If we don't know anything else, let's assume this UTC. And if I wanted the time in Kolkata, I could simply say, well, first of all, localize it to, to UTC such that you're certain that this here meant the UTC time. And then we can, uh, we have to time zone convert that to whatever time we want to have. And then we get the time in Kolkata. So we see that for everything here, we have this df.date, which is simply the date column. And then we call this .dt, which is the daytime accessor. So Rüdiger, cho Rüdiger told you two weeks ago, two weeks ago that there is this, uh, no, last week, that there is this .str accessor for strings if you want to access string functions methods. And if you want to access daytime methods on series data frames, indices, and so on, you have to call this .dt assessor such that you get this tz localize and tz convert. Okay. Yeah, because I've made it already. So once it is daytime aware, um, time zone aware, it cannot be made time zone aware again. Okay. Um, for those of you thinking in Unix time, where the value is simply, like I said, underlyingly, if uh, Pandas compares daytimes, it uses the value, which is the value nanoseconds. Um, and if we get if we get the time tuple from this, this is something the standard Python can work with, or rather the time uh, the Python time module. And this here is the Unix time, which is what you, uh, if you didn't have a smart type. Um, for date times, you would use the Unix time to compare dates because this is simply the time in seconds starting at the 1st of January 1970, um, which is this year right now. And if we have the, uh, if we get the time tuple from our pandas time, uh, from a pandas date time object, we can make a normal Python time out of this, which is represented as Unix time. Yeah. And just like the normal Python time, um, those of you who work with this already know that um, we can format, format these um, timestamps using a special set of symbols. What the symbols are is given here. And this is like if you, you can print it like this. So you have, for example, this, like if you have um, time zone, uh, time zone, sorry, a time, timestamp dot, um, STRF, I have no clue what it stands for actually right now. It prints the time formatedly, string format, probably string format. Um, you can use these um, signs, so percent and then a letter to represent the time in such a way. So for example, we see here that the, we use the percent A and if we look at this table, percent A gives me the weekday as the locales for name I think my local is in English because I have it in English. Oops. And then if I print it like this, so date dot uh, formatted string time, formatted time string, I can say today is Tuesday because it takes the date which I somewhere made before um, and then I give, so that's of course not today, but um, whenever I've created this date, so I can also daytime dot now. Uh, let's not do that. So that day was Tuesday. And just like that, I can convert any, um, I can also convert um, time strings. So pandas, like I said, is really good at getting um, the time from a normal string using true daytime. In case pandas would not be able to do that, you can also manually say that um, by specifying the format of how you of how pandas isn't supposed to interpret the time. So if I didn't have the uh, the um, hyphen here, but instead I had a I don't know, I'm not sure if it works like this. Um, so if I didn't provide format string. I'm not sure pandas would know what to do with this time string. So imagine somebody made a really stupid time string and you're supposed to convert it. Aha, pandas doesn't know what to do. But if you specified pandas, well, some idiot made the time string like this, pandas can still interpret it. So to daytime accepts this format string and every daytime object has this um, formatted string time, SURF time, 
method, which can format a, a daytime the way you want to have it. Okay, and using this, um, the uh, behavior of print and process time, we can write a function, for example, that takes a date time and shows a text like that day is blah, 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 blah. So I give you three minutes, there's probably not enough time to look it up. So this 21st, I didn't find any better way than writing this function that simply takes a number and makes like the 21st, gonna get the ST and everything else basically gets the TH. Um, but yeah, so look up how to use, look up here on how to use the format strings to create a text from a timestamp like this. Okay, so because I had this, uh, I needed the, the, the ordinal function in between here, I needed to um, format string the time uh, three times because I needed to get the Tuesday out of it first, then the, 21st, then the 21, which with this ordinal function, I then make the 21st, and then um, the May, which is the percent B, um, and then the year. So I now run it. Well, I assumed I would have <laughs> would be here on Tuesday. Well, what a wrong assumption. Um, but today is Thursday, the 23rd of May 2019. Yeah. So, um, first one was percent A. We saw that already up here. Second one was percent D, which gave me the 21. And then I made an ordinal number out of this. So this here was, this gave me a string. Need to make an end of it, in all of it to put it into my ordinal function here. And then I simply had the off and then May, the month is percent B as we see somewhere here, month is look at its full name. And then year 2019 is simply percent J, uh, percent Y. Okay. Yeah, okay, good. 
um, then making daytime index. So like I said, timestamps can be used to index data. And because Pandas was originally made for time series, well, this is what we assume, what we always do with um, datetimes. So we can make a datetime index, which automatically calls this pandas.2 datetime on all the strings we give it. Then we can make a series, and we can index these series with these datetimes. So we see here, this is last year's, um, last year's uh, lecture plan. And it's really nice, because this is the index now, and these are the dates. Why is it nice to have dates as index? Well, because we can call all kinds of functions um, on our daytime index, for example, to re-index or to get the mean of a year, of a month, of a day, whatever. So first of all, I can also um, slice the dates like I assume I can slice them. I can slice them even on strings because they're somehow strings. They're obviously not strings. As we see here, if we call schedule.index, we see that it's not strings, but a daytime index. And yeah, just I told you before, just like there's not a number, an AN for numbers, there's an AT, not a time for timestamps. And is null checked uh, for missing dates in daytime index objects and for missing num. So if you have, so if you call the is null function, it will check for NANs, NATs, and nuns. Because missing values in daytime indices will be, or daytime like objects will be rep represented as not a time in object arrays um, or in numeric arrays. Uh, NumPy we use NAN and also in, in integer arrays since uh, January of this year. And in object arrays, some pandas will sometimes use none. All these are checked with the is null. So if you don't know if you're concerning with dates or with numbers, use is null instead of is na. Good, as much for timestamps. So timestamps are simply one point in time. Pandas doesn't only have one point in time. Pandas also has a time delta, which is simply like a span of time, no matter when it is. So simply the span of one day or the span of, I don't know, 365 days. And Pandas also has periods, which is a time stamp with a time span. So um, a span of one day starting at today. These are all useful, and together they provide um, a nice arithmetic because if I subtract, for example, a day from another day, it doesn't make sense to return a date time again, but it makes sense to return a time delta because today minus yesterday um, or tomorrow minus today would be one day of difference in time. So that makes sense too. And just like there's two date time, there's pandas.2 time delta, which accepts. Um, all kinds of strings that represent a time delta, for example, one day, and will yield me um, the time delta of one day, zero hours, minutes, and seconds. And just like that, so like I said, it provides me full arithmetic, and I can simply, I had my schedule here before, which were date times, and the date time, so uh, I can add a time delta onto a date time. And if I simply add this time delta of one day to my schedule, um, I get the schedule shifted shifted it already, I get the sh schedule shifted one day. So I can add time deltas to date times to make new date times, which makes total sense. Okay, and for example, if I wanted to convert, so these here, not anymore, but if I load it in use, so these were um, the times, uh, the dates from last week. And if I wanted to, for example, get the times for, uh, from last year, I mean, if I want to get the times from this year, well, what I can do, is I can create a new time delta. Like I said, if I subtract two time stems, uh, two date times, I get a time delta. And I can subtract um, the current time from the time that was, um, um, from the time the last year uh, the lecture, first lecture was. If I add this time delta now, so like I said, this year yields a time, de uh, a time delta. And if I add this to my schedule, it in place, I get um, the current times. So this is this Thursday, next Thursday, this Thursday after that, and so on and so on. So if I don't change the index to the date, I would have the time in there too, and I don't want that. So I delete the um, hour and minutes by simply calling dot index dot date, making my index like making my index the date of my index, and tada, I am left with um, the times for today. So it makes sense to have timestamps and time deltas. 
so yeah, imagine if Y day was this one date, um, then I could get Saturday by adding the time delta of one day to that. And now I have a Saturday, which is a timestamp again. I can compare if Saturday is bigger than Friday, and well, Friday is um, the 5th of January 2018, Saturday is the 6th, so yes, Saturday is bigger than Friday. And I can again call Saturday minus Friday, which yields me the time delta of one day, which makes total sense. Um, if we are working with time series data, for example, on the stock market, then it's relevant to consider only business days. Um, so dates excluding public holidays and Fridays uh, and Saturdays and Sundays. And Pandas even has a function for that. Like I said, Pandas is really made for this daytime stuff. And I can um, add one business. So if I add one business day on Friday, Pandas will know that it has to go from Friday to Monday, skip Saturday and Sunday, such that Monday is actually not. So if I add one business day to my Friday, I get a Monday and not a Saturday. Yeah, OK. Um, date range. Um, so I created my daytime index here using many strings for the dates. A more convenient way to create such an index is a date range. And a date range um, accepts, for example, a start date and periods, or a start date and the, uh, start date, the periods and the frequency, or a start date and a stop date. So um, if we specify the periods, we specify how many entries we want, we could alternatively um, set an explicit stop and we always have the frequency there as well. So if we specify the start date, we say, I want five periods, and I want frequency, I want week, then what we would get is we would get, well, five dates split by one week. Now if we do that, what do we see? I said I wanted um, a weekly period, a weekly frequency, I mean, from um, the 4th of June, and now I get as first date the 6th of June. This, this is because this frequency equals W um, doesn't mean a frequency of seven days, but means the end of each week. So Sunday of this week. So if I want an explicit seven days from the day I actually specified, I have to say frequency equals seven days and it will make me the correct frequency. So this is also the correct frequency. It's weekly on Sundays, but you have to know that it's weekly on Sundays and it changes even your first date to Sunday. So instead of the number of periods, I could also specify, for example, here that I don't want that I want a uh, stop date. I want the okay. I have no clue right now. Or can I just simply say the date? Here? Ah, yeah. I can simply say the date, not stop. So why the black here? So yeah, same thing. Okay, um, pandas is smart at inferring frequencies. So if I um, say pandas, please infer the frequency for me, and I have dates where which are two days after each other, pandas will know that the frequency here is two days. Okay, and having this index, then I can create a new series, set my daytime index as index, and I have a series. And um, what I will show you in a second, and I'm just teasering now, so if I wanted to get, um, so this is frequency two days, if I wanted to resample that, having a daily frequency, I can do so using pandas, uh, so using um, my series dot resample and say my new frequency, for example, daily. Um, but if I do that, this resample is basically the same as a group by which makes sense somehow. So it's only like this dispatch object I can call other functions on. For example, I can get the mean or I can get the sum. And if I do that, well, it will sum up me. Um, I actually don't know what it sums in this case. So it gives me a zero for the first, which is the sum of the first day. Then it gives me a zero again for day four. Okay, so it doesn't sum really much doesn't make too much sense in this case, but we have the index in the way we want, which is a daily frequency. We'll get to that um, below in a second. Okay, so as much for time stems and for time deltas, what we also have here are periods. 
So the period um, is used to signal that a topic, for example, belongs to like a period of time, um, so an entire week or an entire day instead of one specific point in time. So just like there's uh, pd.daytime, there's pd.period, and if we don't, uh, if we simply provide a date, a day, and pr don't provide the uh, frequency we want to have it, it will simply say where well, this is properly um, of day uh, of frequency day. So we can look at it. It tells me if I don't specify explicitly, it will assume I mean a day as frequency. <coughs> Okay, and just like that, I can also add um, time deltas to frequency, uh, to periods again. Now this is the period of the 5th of June, also for one day. Okay, um, so just like I can make, what was, um, just like I have a date range, I also have a period range. And if I say, well, I want a period range from this day on, I want five periods and I want a weak frequency, um, pandas will know that, well, it starts at Monday and stops at Sunday, I guess. Yeah, we, know, we knew that the 10th of June was a Sunday. We had that already. So it will know that the week that it's now um, each period has one week range because we said frequency equals week. Okay, um, we can easily convert between times and periods. So um, a period has two timestamps and um, my timestamp has two to period again, and if we call to period, we have to call, uh, we have to say what frequency we want again. Um, so this, if I s simply call the normal to timestamp, I get the start of the period. If I call to timestamp with somewhere in E, no, there was a keyword argument. Ah, how equals E. Um, then it will give me the end of my period instead of the beginning. Oh. Ah, because we're not a period right now. Not a period range. I want to convert it. Yeah. So this would be the end of each week, which would which would be where the Sunday at almost twelve. Where was my period again? So my period was um, the 5th of June and the period length was one day. And if I want to change the period length, I need to convert it to a timestamp and then back to a period with a new frequency. So if I want to make that a frequency of two days, I can convert it to a timestamp and then back to a period. If I don't want to resample, this is the smartest way to create a two-day period from a one-day period. Hmm. Okay, um, then because I didn't know where else to put it, I have this insertion here for accessing values in series. This is um, again a new thing which was added in Pandas 0.24, so which is there only in the newest version if you have installed Pandas after January of this year. So imagine we had this period range here and we can call dot array which will return an arrays.pandas array, or in this case, like a child of arrays.pandas array, namely pandas. Uh, namely um, a period array, which is a so-called thin wrapper around a normal numpy.nd array. Um, it isn't especially useful on its own, but it provides the same interface as, panda, uh, as numpy arrays would. So if I call dot array on some series, I get a pandas array, which is basically the same, which has the same uh, methods as my numpy array. And if I want to get the explicit numpy array, I can also do so by using the method dot numpy. So this method and this dot array accessor is new since pandas dot 0.24. Before that, we used dot values, which sometimes need to create a hard copy, which was bad for your RAM, of course. And um, so now dot something dot values is officially um, deprecated. I know it's not officially deprecated yet, but eventually pandas will get rid of it, and you should use dot array and dot two number instead because they are much faster and much more efficient. So yeah, but even if I converted my um, my indexes indices here to a number array, this is still a number array of pandas periods, right? So every single element in there is still a pandas period. 
So it simply creates smart near number array out, of it, array out of it without copying the values. Okay, um, almost done. Last thing is um, reading time series da data and then working with it a bit. So imagine, so first of all, let's import our stuff again to make sure we import it correctly because I want to plot. And um, last week, uh, no, on Tuesday, I didn't have this nice big plots here. Okay, I don't have any nice big plots here to show. But I had these smaller plots. This was because I used the standard Matplotlib style. And if you want the nice big plots, including the grid and with the blue background and stuff, you can simply call matplotlib.style.use and then the Seaborn style. I will finally know why sometimes I had it and sometimes I didn't. It depends on if you first import uh, matplotlib and then Seaborn. And then even it sometimes doesn't work. But if you tell matplotlib explicitly to use the Seaborn style, you get the nice big style I will show in a second. And I also make, want to make the, figure, the figures bigger because that's also the style I had before and I like that. So I want to recreate that style. Okay, so imagine we had our time series data stored as um, FWF file, which is a fixed width something. I don't know what the last F stands for. Fixed width format. Ah, fixed width format. So what we have here, it's basically like a CSV file, but we don't have comma separation but every element has a fixed width. So we know that this here is the first column. So rather this here, no wait, this here somehow is the first column, and then this here is the second, and then this here is the third column. So this read FWF works just like read CSV, just for this very kind of file, which has tabs as, um, as um, separation instead. So we can read this, calling pandas .read, uh, read fwf. Um, we don't, as we see, so this is how the text file looks like, right? So if we, nope, we're not in this week. We're in this week. So this is normal txt file, as we see here. It doesn't have a header, and um, we don't want to use the um, years index. Uh, we do want to use the years index, so let's read it in like this. And what we get is, well, it's in, it's indexed at the year, yeah, but that's still a stupid idea because we only have the year. So this is, an inter, in, this is an integer index. We don't want that because if we're working with time series data, we don't we want date times as index and not um, integers, right? So we see that this is an in64 index, which is not what we want. Um, to tell pandas that we want to have a date time index from the date time, we have to use the past dates. Um, uh, keyword argument. So this works just the same on CSV files or on JSON files or on whatever files you want to read. And we tell it, well, police pass the dates, and the dates are specified in the zeroth, which is the year, and the first, which is the month column. And then this infer daytime format is tells pandas to use a smarter way of inferring the daytime format. It makes sense to always have this parameter set to true because the smarter way also happens to be faster and I don't see any reasons against not using this keyword argument all the time you read any file. So faster, more efficient, better at inferring date times, so we always use that. And if we read it like this, um, pandas will use a daytime index instead, as we see here. So it will represent each month, uh, each, well, each row as one month of a year. So this starts at 1950 and I don't know how far it goes, it goes until 2016. Okay, so we have a data index, this is nice. And if we plot it, well, there's a lot of stuff to plot. Like I said, this is a pretty plot because we plotted Seaborn style. Um, well, it can do so. So it gives me even the year here on the x-axis. This is nice, so if it represents it like this. And yeah, we have a lot of information. So this here is some stock value of some something, I don't know. Actually, it's not a stock value probably because it's centered at zero, right? I have no clue what kind of data this is. It's from Rudiger. Okay, um, but the nice thing, if our series here is indexed by timestamps, we can aggregate using time-related semantics. So, for example, from our index, we can always get the years. And if we group by this year, and then because group by only gives me this group by object, I have to call some aggregation function, let's say the mean. And if I do that, well, I, re I um, took the mean of all the month in the respective year. So this works nice. And if I plot that now, it looks way nicer. This is the average of each year of whatever this value is. 
So I can work with this already much better than with this, I guess, because this is well too much for me to look at the plot. So this is the yearly plot in, in the mean of each year. This is nicer to look at, and I can do that. It makes even more sense to use a pandas.grouper to specify more complex groupings. For example, we can, um, so this grouper, then we can provide a frequency. And we know this frequency is already from before. I have somewhere down below here, this is a table with the frequency strings. So I can tell that with that many numbers of years, I can even do stuff with the business year again. Um, I can do, well, calendar year, Easter holiday. Oh, oh, Easter holiday doesn't work. Um, and yeah, so these are some of the frequency things that are not even all because I can combine. I can simply say five of whatever this is. So imagine I wanted to um, group by only by, well, a frequency of five years. So I want to um, merge every five years into one value. I can do so by calling this pandas.grouper for a frequency of five years. And yeah, I didn't plot that again, I think. Did I plot that again? No, I didn't. So if I plot that, well, I mean, this would be, this would have less points, duh. Okay, so if we look at the first index, we see here that it's a frequency of five years. Um, all the time we take the December, so if we have this year, it's like as we had the week before, week always takes Sunday, year always takes December. If we wanted to not have December, we had, had to specify 365 days times five. Okay. So yeah, it converts every element into this timestamp at the end of the respective frequency. Um, why am I showing the head again? I just did that. Yeah. Um, however, the data I had here was monthly data, which means I cannot provide a smaller frequency. So for example, a day daily, because well, it doesn't have that many dates, right? So I can do so. But it simply provides me not a number for all the time it didn't know um, what value there was. So there was, so I grouped by the day, and where the 1st of January 1950, there was something to group, but the 2nd of January 1950, there wasn't a value. I can't group this value, so there's just nothing in there. I can do so, but it gives me many not a numbers. And this is not grouping, but this is rather resampling. I can do so. Um, but I have to call, but I have to tell pandas on how to do that. Like, how would pandas know what the value of whatever this is was on the 2nd of January 2000, uh, 1950? So I can do so explicitly by, sailing, by, by telling pandas to resample the data. So if we do not like the frequency at which the data sampled, we can change the sample frequency. So let's look only at uh, the year 1950 to, 1950 to make it a bit shorter here. So let's plot our year 1950. So we have um, 12 months in 1950, so we get 12 plots, um, 12 dots here. So this makes sense. And now, because like I said, really nice at working with daytimes, I can call S frequency, and then I can specify a frequency, for example, 12 days, and I can also specify a method of how pandas are supposed to make the dates where there wasn't any value. And just like we had last week, for the missing data, yeah, we had last week the method forward fill, and forward fill simply repeats the value from before for all dates afterwards. So if I, if I um, tell it as we can see 12 days, where the 1st of January 1950, we knew that, that's the same as here, but now for every other date, we simply copy that because we forward fill. And then for the 2nd, or rather for the 6th of February, where there was another value because it forward fills from the 1st of February. So as we can see, needs a method on how to fill it. Of course, it, it doesn't invent new, like it, it, it does invent new data, because, new data because it didn't know the data before. We can call that, it's nicer to plot, um, but it's not as precise. So this here, I oh know this is first of all the original plot again. And as we see, if we resample or if we take the S frequency, it doesn't um, do the very, where did it die? dies. I have no clue where it died. And it froze. So last time this happened, I just was, I just needed to wait. So maybe I'm just going to wait. 
couple of minutes and see what happens. So yeah, if you don't know what to do right now, the homework is already uploaded. Look at the homework. I don't know. Ah, something's good. Hmm. I have no clue how it freezes from time to time. Yeah, but at least one works. Okay. Ha ha ha. Okay. So, um, like I said, I can um, resample it with my S frequency method. However, I always have to be aware um, that it it's like it, it has to find the point somehow. And it doesn't like get the gets the value out of thin air. So if I don't use any method for my S frequency 12 days, I only get these two data points because those were the only two data points where the frequency of one month did correspond to the frequency of 12 days. So the first date was the same, the first of January, and then one, two, three, four months. So four times 30 is the same as an integer times 12. So this value here is also the correct value. So if I don't provide a method on how to find the missing values, well, it will only have the values which like where the frequencies um, correspond to this, uh, like um, have a mutual point. Um, so I need to have some method, for example, forward fill and backward fill. Um, but as we see here, so the blue one is the forward fill, the green one is the record fill and the red ones, so the red points are the original data points. So we see here that this looks completely different. So they're all the same on this point because well, their forward and backward fill just had to get the correct point. But so what backward fill simply does, uh, so what forward fill simply does, it will take this value and repeat it as long as it gets a new value. Here it got a new one, so it repeats this value as long as it gets a new one, got here a new one, so repeat this value, repeat this. So we see that the blue line drags behind the red dots all the time and simply connects this dragging behind the red dots. And what backward fill does, so it always takes the next value. So here it knew a value. Um, and for this frequency, where well, it says, OK, I'm going to take this. And it, it doesn't drag behind, but it, like, it drags before. So it always takes the height of the next point. So as we see, um, so probably they're both white between those two points here, or rather they're both white here, and then they're white on this one point and on this one point. And on all other points, they're not precisely white. So you can do that, you can um, resample, but as we see, it has to invent the data somehow, and it's n not definitely um, the correct one. Okay, um, downsampling can be done just as easy as upsampling. Um, and it even makes more sense. We can simply, well, as we can see, with a smaller frequency, so three months instead of one month, and we get something like this. Um, note that this then doesn't include the December because the um, January plus three months plus three months it ends again in January because twelve like twelve months it would end again in January, so it would get a point somewhere here again, but um, it doesn't know what to do with um, December if we don't, um, yeah, if we only go, and it doesn't know what to do for January because it doesn't go until January, and then we don't have any value for December. So if this is white, meh, it also doesn't look white, it simply connects a few points. Both of these are not really perfect. So this we could use if we wanted to add the last date. Um, we simply appended this stuff. OK, um, that was specifying a different frequency. I always um, 
uh, uh, mistook it by saying we sample, but basically what we did was resampling. Um, we can also combine this resampling with an aggregation, and that's then the pandas method resampling. Okay, so let's look at real stock data. I finally know what this is. So we have um, here this Yahoo stock data somewhere here, Yahoo stock. This is what it looks like. So it gives me um, a day, not every day. There are some missing values as we see, and then uh, the opening, close and close value, and the high and the low, and whatever the volume means. I don't know anything about stock. Okay, um, if we plot that, this looks really like stock data, right? So this is what Pandas was actually made for to work with. Okay, and then um, what we want to do here, for example, we want to resample. These are quite a few years. It starts the 2009 and ends the 2013. Um, and like I said, there's this resample method and we want to resample at BA. BA is, I think, the end of each business year. A business year end, yes. And if we resample this, it looks like this. So what's the difference here between our S frequency and our resample? Well, our red line is S frequency, and what we see here, well, it only takes the last date all the time. So this here is the entire data, and at the end of the business year 2010, it had this value. At the end of business year 2011, it had this value. 2012 this value, end of 2013 this value, end of 2014 this value. So if I simply call S frequency, it only takes the, like the corresponding point of our original data. If I resample the data, I have to specify some mean, uh, some, some aggregation function, which would be the mean. So this makes way more sense. So this here gives me the mean of the entire business year 2019, which is this. This, this dot here is the mean of this business year, which is like this this business year, this business year, and this business year. So resampling is the way better um, estimate, right? So just because at the end of 2013, the stock value of um, Yahoo was really good, well, this is, not a represent like, this is not representative for the entire year, but the mean is more representative. So resampling with specifying the correct aggregation function makes more sense. So just as I have the mean here, I can also provide the max. Um, which then looks even more extreme. But yeah, like I said, the mean would be um, the best one. Okay, um, with that, we're almost through. Uh, this is, I think, the last but one thing, so shifting and differencing. So shifting data um, has two ways of how shifting data is useful. We have shift that actually moves the data. So that means if I move it by one year to the future, um, then I don't know what the first year has for data. So there are missing values at the one end. And we lose something at the other end because we didn't have indices for um, the last year because we shifted it by one year. So we create missing value at one end and lose data at the other. Um, T-shift only shifts the index of the data and not the data itself. So by T-shift, I simply say what you called 2012 before, you're now going to call 2011 or something. So um, this is what it looks like. So blah, blah, blah. Um, this is simply the plotting. We have three subplots. One, uh, the first one is the normal data. So our TS, um, our, our normal TS, which is the time series for Yahoo. And the second one, we want to resample it well daily and then shift it by 365 days. And the third one, we T-shift by 365 days. And then we just show stuff and make it prettier. And this is what it looks like then. So this is our original data. And this is our data shifted by 365. Like I said, we have missing values at the start, and we lose this entire year because it would be here. And T-shift, on the other hand, simply makes, well, there used to be 2011 here, so this year, they share the axis here, so this year is certainly the same as this one. And there used to be the January of 2011, but now there's 2012. We simply shifted everything by one year. Simply renamed the dates, basically, by the following year. So shift and T-shift, completely different things. Both are shifting. Okay, um, yeah, almost done. Why do we do shifting? Well, shif shifting is useful for calculations that compare values across time stamps. So if we wanted to look at the one day difference, so if we wanted to know if Yahoo lost or uh, lost value or gained value on one day, well, what I can do 
is I can um, shift it by one day and then subtract that. Okay, so I have the original data uh, minus the data shifted by one day. This is centered around, around zero, around zero, of course, because it makes sense, because it either gained or lost value from day to day, or well, it had, um, like, it was around the same uh, value as the day before. So, yeah, some days it gained, some days it lost, and because this is a really useful function that you often need, um, Pandas pro provides the convenient diff method, which basically does the very same thing as this one and also produces the same plot as we see. Yeah, so taking the difference between two days. Okay, and then this here is the very last thing for today, window functions. Window functions are basically a group by that they split data into different groups based on something, but in this case, this something is simply a changing window. Um, and then, like group by, we need some kind of summary statistics um, to, to do like we have this one window of time and then we need some statistics, I want the mean, I want the max, I want whatever of this value. So the easiest one is the rolling window, which is the standard example of our window function. Um, and well, what does it do here? Well, it takes, what did we call it with? With mean or with max? So we got the mean. So for the first one, it simply makes a cut here and a cut here and calculates the mean of all these values, which is here. And then for the next value, it made a cut a bit more here and a bit more here, found a new mean, and then it shifted like um, the window to the right. And this looks shitty if we printed our, uh, onto our original data because, um, well, it's always the end of this frame um, is there, like it's, it's, not, it's not centered, but we can simply say with keyword argument center equals two, I want it centered. And now we see where this is, all the time is the mean of this period. This here is the mean of this period, this here is the mean of this. This is next dot or something, so this makes much more sense. Okay, um, this is one way of, um, of windowing function. The next way is an expanding window. So an expanding window only takes a minimal size and then grows bigger with each step, taking all previous values in the, into account. Useful if my time series measures a stationary value that only fluctuates around the mean. So I have a stationary value, I make measurements of my stationary value, and while if I only have like 10 measurements and take the mean of 10 measurements, this is a really imprecise measure which doesn't have much statistical power, if I take a thousand measurements, eventually my, um, my mean of that, so if I uh, take the expand an expanding window of all thousand, or if I made 10,000 measurements of all 10,000 measurements, the mean would eventually um, go to the original value. It doesn't make much sense in our stock data, however. So this is the same mean as before, so this is my first frequency. And then I take this, and 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 so on. And in the end, this point is the mean of my entire time series. Doesn't make much sense in stock data. Makes sense if we have one um, uh, time series that has a stationary value, and we have measurements for the stationary value. And then, as the last thing for today, we have the exp exponentially weighted window, which is basically the, sh the, the same as my... Um, as my rolling window, just that I don't have hard edges, like I don't have these two hard edges, but I have an exponential window around my mean that takes this value into account most, and um, the further I go to the outside, the less um, the value counts. So for every single point, like to get this point, I have a function, yeah, that, or rather, that, let's have it here, that takes like this very point into account most, the one a bit shifted to the left a bit less and to the right too, and then less and less and less, and then that gets this, and that it makes for every single point. So with my, with a close exponentially weighted window, um, I make something that looks really much like the plot. If I make my window bigger, it doesn't look as good. But I mean, on the other hand, I could also, if I have my window here, I could also make my windowing function, my rolling mean here, I could just have for two days, and then it looks also really close, of course. 
really, really close. So it basically does the same as my normal as my as my hard window. So my hard window, if I want to calculate um, the value of one point, like say I want to calculate the value of, of I don't know of this of uh, no wait let's not do it like this. So if I have my hard window, yeah, say the centered one, if I want to have um, want to calculate where this first dot is supposed to be, I simply take all the values from here to here, so all the blue stuff, all the y values from here, and simply get the mean of them, which is, which makes sense. In my exponentially weighted window, I say I simply don't have this hard window, but I have a soft window. I say, well, for, uh, to, get, to get the value at this position, I take, <coughs> this data point into account most, and then I also take this one into account and this one, but with a, um, not with a normal mean, so they're not weighted the same, but it's simply a weighted mean. So take this one into account most, this one with a bit smaller weight, this one with a smaller weight, and the further I go outside, the smaller um, the weight for my weighted average. So it's a weighted average with an exponential function to tell um, how, of, of how the, how much to take a certain distance into account. Yeah, okay, and that's already that for it. So working with time series, Pandas has a really, really huge um, user guide to work with time series. It's really useful and tells you basically everything, much more than I could tell today. And yeah, that would be already it. Uh, of course, we always, um, there's a PyCon presentation with a complete time series in the tutorial, much more than I talked about. If you want to look at this, really useful. All right, yeah, I finished after less than 90 minutes. Good. So, yeah, that would be it for today. Then I can, of course, show you the next homework. This homework is, um, I think, much quicker done than the others because it doesn't contain, uh, like, it doesn't contain anything new. You don't really have to look up stuff. So we make categorical columns. So turning the sex column into unordered categories, we did that already in, Tuesday, in the Tuesday lecture. Um, P class and embark, we can turn into ordered categories. Blah blah blah. And like this is simply making categories. This is like one line each, so this is really quickly done. And uh, this is how it's supposed to look like. So we see um, that, for example, the age is not the age anymore, but we simply say young or middle age or senior or teenage. Okay, pivot tables make two pivot tables. We also did that on Tuesday. Two functions, pd.pivot table. This takes like a few minutes. This is really, really quick. And then time series indexing. So what we have here, we have a new data set, the Ebola data set. For, uh, we have, don't have a new data set. We had this already last week when we tidied data. And um, now we first want to smooth it such that well, if we only smooth it um, without any method, well, we see we have many missing values. And, um, but we want that. Uh, no, in the end, we forward fill the not available time. Ah, yeah, club. Uh, we forward fill. So if we forward fill, we don't have the values at first because, well, there's nothing to forward fill, as we know. And yeah, and then we compute a rolling mean over that, and we're done. Also important, like I said, if, um, so please uh, go for this uh, clicker questionnaire if you want to take the exam or not. And again, if you didn't get any emails called scientific programming Python homework status report from this email address. Or if something's wrong in there, please tell me so. Um, and please tell me so as soon as possible. Uh, I don't want any last minute complaints. Complaints? Is it with or without the T? Never mind. Yeah, and if you have to, comp uh, if you complain, do so at cstinkham.us.de and not at the original email you got it from because I don't look into that as often because it's just one throwaway email. 
Um, yeah, answer me, tell me if you're complaining, and that should be it. Yeah, and if you now want to start working on the homework, please do so. I will still be here for the next 30 min mm, uh, for the next 20 minutes. Uh, so we have 12 normal homeworks, and like I said, for next week I will give a bonus most likely, and a normal homework. So we have wait, this is this is eight, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve plus one bonus plus probably another bonus. So there are probably like seven homework left, including the bonuses. But you need ten to pass. You need ten to pass, yeah. So yeah, just to to make that sure, right? You need. So there are twelve. Normal homework, because there are 12 weeks, every week gives a normal homework, so there are 12 normal homeworks, and then once in a while, for example, as we did already at week three, and as if I talk about it, the more often I talk about it, the more certain I need to do that. So if there would be a bonus exercise next week, there will be a bonus exercise next week, um, then there are at least 14 homework, and it doesn't matter if you do um, nine normal, one bonus, or 10 normal, or eight normal, two bonus, like the sum of bonus plus normal needs to equal 10. So you need to have like 10 from 14 or 10 or 15 homework overall, including the bonus. And again, um, so I don't, I'm not sure because I have to discuss that with Rüdiger on how lenient um, we are going to be. Um, but normally, what is, so the thing that counts yeah, is if it passes online, because this is how we measure the homework. So the GitHub API, we call the GitHub API and ask if there is this X or not. So if you have this X there, then the automatic correction of the homework will tell you that you did not pass this homework, and this is what we count. So please make sure that there's a tick here instead of the X, because this is what counts. Like I said, if you're not happy with that, write us an email, we'll see what we can do. But generally, you heard it a few times already, so please make sure that there's a tick. So if I look at the sample solution, there's a green tick. And this is what you are supposed to have, too. Green tick. You don't have this tick. Look again at the homework. Like I said, I showed you this two weeks ago or something. If you go here onto Travis and look at the details, it will tell you what the error was, and you can well, it normally should be the same as uh, on your local machine. This doesn't work actually for you, but yeah, this is the log of PyTest, and here PyTest doesn't fail, and if it should fail, Travis will tell you why it did. Yeah, so like I said, I will stay here for the next 20 minutes. If you want to work on the homework, do so. Okay.